Welcome to African Insights. Let's explore the truth about Africa. African Insights, please kindly subscribe and like the channel. In black and white, we will narrate the true African story. There was never people called Koi San or San or Koi or Hottentots or Bushmen. It's expressions used by false scholarship who are uninformed of who indigenous people are because it suits their perspective by naming indigenous societies into their own accord, not correctly how they would refer to themselves. Through derogatory slurs and racial stereotypes, African people were dehumanized and stripped of their dignity. These terms not only reflect the ignorance of the past, but also highlight the ongoing need for education and awareness. Terminology surrounding these groups has been a subject of debate and discussion among scholars and indigenous communities. The terms Khoisan and San have been used in academic and popular discourse to refer to a group of indigenous people in Southern Africa who share certain linguistic and genetic characteristics, including the use of click consonants in their languages. However, it is important to note that these terms can be oversimplifications and do not capture the full diversity and complexity of the various indigenous communities in the region. Similarly, the term koi or koi koi has been used to describe a distinct group of pastoralist indigenous peoples in southwestern Africa. Again, it is acknowledged that these labels may not fully encompass the diversity and unique identities of the different indigenous communities that fall under this category. It is crucial to respect the self-identifications and preferences of indigenous peoples themselves when referring to their communities. Indigenous peoples have their own distinct languages, cultures, and ways of identifying themselves, which should be acknowledged and respected. African people through pictures. Pictures that were depicted by engravers or more relatable illustrators before the 18th century. We start off with Jacques Kaper, a Dutch printmaker born in 1761. This is his depiction of the Goi Goi. The Goi Goi, the early white settlers called the Hottentots. Goi Goi means real people or man of men. These are his illustrations or engravements in Cape Good Hope, Southern Africa. In all honesty, it's not a coincidence that these Goi Goi people resemble the chevron patterns in the great walls of Zimbabwe and also for a 17th century engraver to depict stone houses. Next up is Henry Abraham Catalane. He was a Dutch cartographer born in 1648 and passed away 1743. He was basically depicting the customs and habits of the people who live around the Cape of Good Hope, the Hottentots. Next up, we have Robert Jacob Gordon, born 1743 and passed away 1795. He was a Dutch explorer and depicted people of the Namakwalan, Namakwalan being an arid region of Namibia and South Africa. He does have illustration of Hottentots and has even depicted the Tosas, which are found in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. From the illustration of the previous image, do note also the sandals worn. This is actually supported by a book that was authored in 1772 by Andrew Sparman, a naturalist. In the book, he goes to show the filled shoes 
and also some ornaments belonging to the Hottentots. On top of that as well, he further depicts um, tools that the Hottentots use. We will now move to the kingdom of Mutapa. This empire was spread across southern Africa from the Limpopo and Zambezi rivers to the Indian Ocean. It encompassed what is now Lesotho, South Africa, Mozambique, Swaziland, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. We now move to Nicolas de la Mosson, a French engraver born 1632 to 1694, who illustrated the great empire of Mutapa or Monomutapa. This is King Monomutapa by Nicholas. This stamp is a Portuguese impression of Mutapa Gatsi. This is a 1635 map by Willem Jansson, which depicts a vast region named Monomutapa. Munamutapa was the title born by a line of kings ruling an African territory between the Zambezi and Limpopo rivers. The Mutapa's court was in now Zimbabwe, meaning the large house of stone. Now do you think it's a coincidence that from this first kingdom comes one of the most intellectual and skilled people we know as Shona? Remember the close link I want to establish to the kingdom being spread from South Africa to Zimbabwe to Lesotho to Swaziland. One of the ancient legacies of the sand people, what they call Bushmen, is rock art. The rock art created by the Bushmen, also known as the sand people, is a remarkable expression of their culture and heritage. These paintings were made by applying pigments to the surfaces of rock shelters or cave walls. The pigments were typically derived from natural materials such as minerals, ochre, charcoal or plant extracts. Now, where are we going with this rock art? Remember, one of the minerals used to make the art was ochre. And now the first mine known to the world mined ochre and is in Swaziland, Southern Africa. We have thought of East Africa, Omo Valley in Ethiopia to be specific, as having the first human remains. However, fossils recovered in the Rising Star Cave in 2013 in South Africa have rocked one of the most enduring foundations of the human story, that Homo sapiens arose in a cradle of humankind in East Africa about 200 years ago, whilst the discovery of the South African fossils have been reported to be likely as 335,000 years old. Just right next door to South Africa, the oldest mine in the world is in Eswatini. Nguenya mine deposits were worked at least 42,000 years before present for the extraction of red hematite, specularite, which are sparkling ores, and iron ores. Specularite was traditionally worn by chiefs as body paint for ceremonial occasions. Nguenya, which means crocodile, describes the shape of Eswatini's second highest mountain looming above the Nguenya border post and on its southern flank is the oldest mine in the world. For centuries specularite has been sought after as a cosmetic. The first beauty parlor is over 40,000 years old, long before the days of Cleopatra and Helen of Troy the heart of Africa. Cosmetics were being mined to beautify men and women. Hematite or red ochre became the main pigment for rock paintings. The beautiful tales from Bleak and Lloyd's Bushman folklore give us a clear picture of what the Bushmen did with specularite in ancient times. They rubbed it into the 
their hair to make themselves look more attractive. The first mention of Khoi Khoi in European travel literature comes from the journal of Bartolomeo Dias, the Portuguese sailor who first rounded the Cape in 1488. Dias wrote that he and his crew sighted land in a bay which they called Angra dos Focuras because of the many cows seen there, watched by their herdsmen. And since they had no language which could be understood, they could have no speech with them, but rather they drove off their cattle inland, as if terrified at such a new matter, so that we could learn no more of them. They were black with woolly hair, like those of Guinea, he proclaimed. The Portuguese did not conquer this region, but chose rather to become allies. Trade and interaction continued with the Portuguese for some 160 years, only up until the first Cape commander, Jan van Riebeck, who describes them as a brutal gang living without any conscience. However, before his time, two Dutchmen, Leander Janssen and Matthias Brut, wrote in about 1649 letters to the directors of the Dutch East India Company of how the Khoi Khoi would benefit the company by their presence at the Cape and arguing against other prevalent viewpoints whereby they wanted the caretakers of cattle, sheep and goats to be the Khoi Khoi. Janssen and Prut said, others will say that the natives are brutal and cannibals from whom no good can be expected and that we will have to be continually on our guard, but this is a vulgar error. They defended the Goi Goi, who killed boatmen and sailors, saying it was only revenge on those that seized their kettle. The Portuguese and British had different perspective and approaches towards the indigenous peoples they encountered in their respective colonial endeavors at the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. On the other hand, the British arrived at the Cape in the late 18th century and eventually established a significant presence. Their approach towards the indigenous people, including the Khoi Khoi, was influenced by the by their expanding colonial ambitions and views of racial hierarchy prevalent at the time. The Goikoi and San were displaced from their land and experienced erosion of their identity by acts of genocide inflicted by the Dutch, British and German settlers. They also suffered greatly under the early segregation policies of the English and the later apartheid regime of the Afrikaners and were later absorbed into the Afrikaans-speaking colored communities, while others were absorbed into dominant societies around them, both African and European, and into the populations of laborers who were brought from Malaya, China, and from other regions of Africa. <laughs> The word Khoi is pronounced as Kwe, and therefore the Khoi's tribal names sounded distinctive, such as Nama Kwe, Oteni Kwe, Hasi Kwe, and the Greek Kwe in the Miracle Root area. Khoi Khoi therefore meant men among men. The Dutch tended to refer to the Khoi as hot and tots, a word which is no longer in use and is considered very derogative. Scholars of the 18th and 19th century have not properly autographed the term Khoi Khoi. Through ignorance, Khoi was promoted instead of saying Khoi. There is so much damage done to the historical narrative of the Khoi that the actual pronunciation is actually Kwe or Kwe, which means people, whereby a man is referenced as Kwa. 
clans and tribes have been grouped wrongfully. Huanguni in definition. In today's world, they are linked to Kosa, Zulu, Ndebele, and Swati, in which in a broader sense it is not at all. Nguni is derived from a click expression which is Una or Uni. The term also exists in Kosa as Unu, whereby the palatal and alveolar clicks have been qualified as Kuna or Kuni. Nguni therefore comes from your Nankwe society who could not pronounce Kuna or Kuna. Linguists believe that the more clicks you have, the older the language is. The Khoisan people have been classified to about five clicks as compared to the three basic clicks of the Khoisans. The landscape before it was divided to South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, etc., to all these various countries, there is a connection within all our people. Today, we are survived by legacies that are not well represented. And as a result, we bring an end to this episode because what we will talk about next is how you, as the Nguni people, are connected. Thank you.